Um, hey, so we're going to be in Psalms 23 today. So if you have your Bibles, do me a favor and go ahead and open up to Psalms 23. And if you're just sitting there and you're like, but Pastor Corey, I have Psalms 23 memorized. Open up your Bible anyway. Don't make the people next to you jealous because you're a super Christian. Okay, <laughs> just open it up. Let's read it together. And let's act like this is the first time, all right? Um, but here's the beautiful thing about Psalms 23. So for me, every time I think of Psalms 23, the first place my mind goes to, there's actually two places my mind goes to, but um, I think like my grandmother had it like cross-stitched somewhere in her house and it just said Psalms 23, like the Lord is my shepherd. And it was just there. Like it took someone seven years to like cross-stitch this thing and it hung there forever, I think until me and my brother knocked it off the wall and broke it. But whatever, that's just what we do, Okay. Um, Also, if you were anything like me and you grew up in the church, so I grew up in a small, like, little Nazareth church, and I believe right inside the lobby, kind of right before you went to the sanctuary, there was, like, this picture of Jesus. Like, it was, like, a Roland Mills, basic, like, he was white, almost. It was, like, a mix between blonde and brown hair. Don't know how the artist, like, did this, but he had, like, Jesus, like, perfectly posed, staff in one hand, and I was like, yep, that's my Jesus. (laughs) That's him. Um... But then life started to go crazy, and there was, like, times in my life I was like, you know, maybe that's not my God. Um, But then I would read things in, like, Psalms 23, and it would take me back to these moments, and I would, like, truly get to understand, like, who Jesus was and what he meant to me. So anyway, Psalms 23, here's what we're going to do. So it's not just completely awkward for me. I want us all to read together, um, because I feel like when you read the Word of God out loud, like, it actually speaks to you more. Um, and you actually get to, it's like hearing God's voice because you're saying it out loud and God wrote it. Isn't that funny? Um, so if you guys can read with me, that'd be great. If you don't have your Bibles or your phone, it's on the screen for the slackers. Are you ready? Cool. Um, it doesn't matter. Here's the beauty of it because I don't care what version you're reading from. Um, I love it when there's like a mix and then everyone's around you like, oh, what they just read? But then I get to hear... <laughs> I get to hear what the other people were reading, and it's like, it's different, and we're actually going to get into that. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Are you ready? Cool. All right. So, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> Amen. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to pray real quick. Is that cool with you guys? Awesome, man. Hey, dear Jesus, we just thank you um, for this moment, Lord. We thank you for this time where we just get to just sit in your presence, God, Lord. We just get to dwell in your word, God, Lord. So I pray that you just speak through me, God. Lord, just let me be the vessel, Lord, as your words just continue to reign throughout this place. Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for what you're going to do. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Man, so Psalms 23. One thing I love about Psalms 23 is, um, for those who don't know, David wrote Psalms 23. And for David to write Psalms 23, it came from something personal because David himself, being a shepherd, he knew exactly what it meant to be a shepherd. Like it just made sense, right? He was a shepherd by trade. And so when he called Jesus his shepherd, he's basically calling himself the sheep. And if you read anything else throughout the Bible, this happens a lot of times. Jesus is called a shepherd, we get called a sheep. And when David is calling himself a sheep, it's not a compliment. Um, Do we know anything about sheep? They are dumb. Um, Sheep are like, (laughs) um, they're just weird. And like, they they just do things. But that's the crazy thing about this psalm is that for David, it wasn't a compliment. It was a cry for help. Because if anybody knew just how bad a sheep needed a shepherd, it was David. And David is writing his whole soul into the psalm. And he's saying, Jesus, I just need you. Because without you, I'm nothing. Because here's the thing about sheep. For sheep, and when sheep are left on their own accord, sheep are known to wander off. Sheep are known to get lost. Sheep are known to like literally put themselves in danger. Like what happens is if a sheep sees rushing water, what they do is not thinking. They literally dunk their whole head in 
to just try and get a drink of water, not knowing they have that weird duffet on their head or whatever we want to call it. And the water literally sucks it up and rushes them off. And then, so the shepherd's like, oh my gosh, my sheep got like rushed down the river again. So he had to like literally take his staff, take it by the neck and rip it out of the water to save it. Like that's just how sheep are. And David's like, listen, I'm a sheep and I just need a shepherd because he knows that a shepherd is willing to lay down his life for their sheep. And that's David throughout this whole psalm. It just starts out with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The other versions that you guys read out loud was, um, I have all that I need. And honestly, we can just stop right there because that's beautiful enough. Like, the Lord is my shepherd. And when I allow him to be my shepherd, when I allow him to lead me, when I allow him to literally just go where I need to go and he is in front of me, I have all that I need because he's providing for me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we allow the Lord to be our shepherd, the second thing he does in this verse is like he makes us do something, which used to always make me mad because I was like, ain't nobody telling me what to do. Like I was that guy. And literally the second verse says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and like he leads me beside the still waters. And like, I get it. You guys don't want God telling you what to do. Like, oh man, God's making me lie down in a nice green pasture. He sucks. Like, come on. Like, here's the crazy thing. I think God wrote this for me. Um, Because, like, left on my own accord, I'm not smart enough to find a nice green pasture to lay down the Sabbath in. God's like, Corey, you need to rest. And I'm like, you're right, I do. Um, Where's the green pasture at? (laughs) Left on my own accord, I can't. Left on my own accord, I'm the sheep that's putting their head in rushing water. Like, I need the still water. I need that nice green pasture. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Like, it goes on and on. When you allow God to be your shepherd, he leads you. He takes you on the right path. He restores you. Everything Wendy was just saying. Like, it's a beautiful thing. The next verse. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That in itself can preach for 38 minutes. So, um... We're not going to sit on that too long, but let's be honest, it's amazing. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Like, this is a beautiful thing. Like, even though we're going through this hard valley, even though we're in the midst of everything that is going on in our country, maybe falling apart, I don't know what's going on. But like, I can sleep good at night because I know that I have a shepherd who, one, has a staff who is guiding me and poking me and prodding me and leading me in the right direction. And when I get stuck into the water, he can pull me out with that same staff. But not only does he have a staff, but David said that he had a rod. And while the rod wasn't for the sheep, the rod was for, listen, the rod was for the lion and the bear. And if you know anything about the story of David, he literally had to whoop a lion and a bear to rescue his sheep. And so David is saying that I can go to bed at night knowing that my God is there protecting me with a rod. I can lay my head on my pillow at night knowing my God is there and I can sleep peacefully. And for me, that means that Corey can go to work every single day and know that God is with me by my side. And I know that I can leave Mackenzie and Oakley at home because God is by their side. And he is protecting us and he is leading us. Verse five, and kind of where we're going to stay at a little bit today is you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. We get to the table, finally. You're welcome. So here's the beauty of this. If it was me writing the psalm, David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If it was me, I would just want the table prepared in the presence of God. Like, why do my enemies need to be there? Like, I already feel surrounded by them. Um, Just pick me up, teleport me out. We'll do our thing. Like, come on, you're God, let's do it. He prepares the table in the presence of our enemies for a reason, and we're going to kind of touch on that a little bit later. But this is what I love about God, is that in the middle of our depression, in the middle of our anxiety, in the middle of our financial problems, our marriage problems, um, all this other things that I'm forgetting to name right now, but whatever you're going through, whatever that valley is, whatever that problem is, whatever it is, God literally shows up. He prepares this table before you, and not only does he prepare it for you, but like he cooks the food, he sets it nicely, um, he pays the bill, and then after he prepares his table, he like sits down. And he's like, hey, 
How's it going? Do you want to join me? <laughs> like, look at this. Man, I did this for you. How's your family? Still good? Yeah. Coffee is on point today, but it's because it's God's table. You know what I'm saying? But he makes the table, and then he sits at the table, and he invites you to sit at the table. And like, here's the crazy thing. Like, here's the king of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, of all mankind, and he's literally inviting you to just sit with him. Like, think about this invitation. Like, how crazy is it? I know Pastor Adam, like, preached on it, like, for a whole month, like, last month, and half of you guys paid attention when we talked about getting into the presence of God, but this is what it looks like. It's God setting up a table in the middle of everything you're going through, and he just wants to sit and have a conversation with you, but we're honestly, like, too busy with our day-to-day to to actually get through this, and so instead of just sitting with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we kind of just, like, use them as a fast food drive through And it's like, man, like, honestly, it's like waking up and God's sitting at the table and he's like, hey, good morning. I've been waiting because God doesn't sleep. Um, he's like, yeah, did you have good dreams? I did that. You're welcome, you know. Um, and you're just getting out of bed and you're like, oh, man, oh, oh, this looks so good. Oh. You know, if only I knew, though, um, because I didn't set an alarm this morning because, you know, I kind of wanted that extra five minutes of sleep. Also, you know, I got to get to work. That's getting crazy. Oh, my goodness, is a baby crying? You know, anyways, this looks great. This is amazing. Um, Do you make that yourself? Oh, dude, so good. Um, But I'm just going to take this and... um, mm. Ooh, yeah, yeah, you have a good day. Actually, no, before I go, God, hang on one second. Um, mm, let me get a photo. Check this out. Mm. And y'all be like, I know you do this because I see your Instagram. Like, don't try me. All right. <laughs> y'all be like, <laughs> uh. you be like, once again. And then you be like, posting and you be like, <clears throat> breakfast with the king. <laughs> Hashtag almighty, hashtag I'm blessed, you know? <laughs> and then you post it. Man, you need to sit at the table for three minutes, but you can tell the whole world about it. So here's the thing. Ooh. When we don't sit at the table, when we don't take time to sit and talk with God, something can happen. And this is where it gets dangerous because if we're not sitting with God, if we're not being careful, what happens is the enemy can sometimes pull up a seat to the table. And a lot of times we don't think he would do that, but here's what I want you guys to see. If you read your Bible, you saw that the devil literally pulled up a seat to Jesus' table in the wilderness. He showed up to Jesus in the wilderness and he tempted him there. Don't think he won't do it to you. And he has the guts to do this because he pulled up a chair in paradise to Eve's table and it worked. You guys remember that story. He got Eve to doubt the character of God. He got Eve to doubt what God truly said and all of creation fell. And if he'll do it in paradise and he'll do it to Jesus, he has no problem doing it to you. Jesus said that the enemy had one purpose and his purpose was to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's just what he is doing. He's come to steal all the plans that the shepherd laid out for you. He wants to kill the dreams and purpose God placed in your life. And honestly, he's just going to destroy you in the process of it all. And here's the crazy thing. He doesn't just come out with all of this in the first 15 minutes that he's sitting at the table with you. He's sly with it. And here's what I love. I don't love this, but here's the crazy thing about the devil. He sits, and it's a very simple thing, because as much as we just want him to go, you know what, Corey, I'm going to take this banana, and I'm going to shove it down your throat and destroy you. Like, he doesn't do that, okay? Um, He doesn't just come out with it, all right? He sits, and he's like, hey, how's the family? The wife's still nagging you? Yeah, she does that. Yeah. 
I don't know how you do it. Crazy. You know what the problem is? It's her mother. She hates you. The problem is they get together and they're... Wah, 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 wah. I, I would have been out of there, bro. I don't know how you do it. <sighs> or even worse, like sometimes he'll just like sit on my tail and he'll be like, huh, how's the boss? Still a jerk? I don't know how you do it either, bro. <laughs> I would have left. Um, you don't need, who need a job? Not Corey, right? <laughs> bro, nah. But this is what he does. <laughs> We can laugh. It's okay. Um, this is what he does. He's so sly about it. He's so slick about it. But honestly, all he's trying to do is he's trying to get you to doubt the character of God. He wants to get you to doubt the character of God or even remind you of your past or something that someone told you that it's going to get you off the path that God has for you. He's going to get you off track. He's going to get you to doubt. He's going to feed your bitterness and anger. And he's going to make you stressed, selfish, and make you lose in the very end. And that's his goal. So how do we know if the enemy is at our table? Great question. Here are five main lies. I'm going to give you guys five main lies that the enemy tries to tell you. And if he's telling you one of these lies, or if one of these lies is in your head, there's just a really good chance he's sitting at your table and he's eating your lunch. Lie number one, it's better at the other table. It's better at the other table. This is like that, I think that all-American lie that tells you that what's over there is better than what I have here. This is that lie that destroys families by saying simply, if I leave my spouse for this other person, life is there. This is also that lie that says, if I continue to work hard, if I continue to strive and I continue to neglect other things and focus on this thing, I'm finally going to get to where I need to be and then I'll be satisfied. Then I'll be happy. Then I'll be content. And listen, I can preach about contentment for like a whole another 48 minutes, but we're not going to go there. Just read Paul's letters. Paul will tell you exactly what it means to be content. All right? It's better at the other table. Lie number two. Ooh, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You didn't come from the right family. You don't have the right background. You're just not good enough. And not only are you just not good enough, but you failed before. And if you failed before, you're going to fail again. And so shame and failure is just going to follow you wherever you go. Because honestly, you suck and you're not good enough. Lie number three, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it out of the situation you're in. You're not going to make it out of your financial hole. You're not going to make it through your marriage problems. You're not going to make it through your first semester of college, wherever those girls are. You're just not going to make it. You're stuck in that storm. You're stuck wherever you are, and you're not going to make it to the other side. You're never going to make it out. And honestly, if you're hearing this today, the enemy is just at your table and he's eating your lunch. And here's the thing that gets me about this lie. And I did not want to go off on a tangent, but I'm going to go off on a tangent so you guys be cool with me for a minute, okay? Because I know what you're thinking. Like, honestly, the devil's just here and he's like, Corey, like, he tells me this all the time. Like, you're not going to make it out. You're not going to make it out. And so I have to sit here and I honestly just have to take authority and be like, listen, I... I can. Because here's the thing about any of these lies. If you want to know if you're telling one of these lies, all you have to do is go to your friend and your friend's going to tell you back what you're telling them. And when it comes to this lie, like when I'm having coffee with anybody and they're like, Corey, how are you doing? And I look at them and I'm like, well, I don't know, man. Like, I'm stuck in a lie. And here's how I know. Because never, ever, 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 ever in the history of mankind has our shepherd and the king of kings ever said, bro, I don't know, man. Like the disciples didn't wake him up in the middle of the boat, in the middle of a storm. And they're like, Jesus, how are we going to get out of here? Jesus didn't look at them and be like, bro, I don't know. (laughs) This one's on you. Like, good luck. And like Jesus hops out and like walks on water, like out of it. That'd be crazy. Um, But he didn't. (laughs) 
Like he calmed the storm and he let them out. And here's the beauty of how I know these things because my Bible and everything we just read said that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because what? You are with me. So here's the thing. Like, honestly, sometimes I don't know if I'm going to make it out of it, but I know something on the other side is going to be great because God is following me everywhere I go and he is with me. Where was I? Line number four. <laughs> Line number four. I'm surrounded and there's no way out. I'm surrounded and there's no way out. Like the bills are piling up, the grass is knee high, the baby's crying, I still gotta go to work. I think my car's making weird noises. Um, my knee hurts, my head hurts. I only got two hands and Kenzie's asked me to make dinner. Like everything's piling up. Not that that has happened Thursday night, but <laughs> I love you. Um, You're surrounded and you feel like there's no way out. It's crazy. The last one, line number five. Let me know if you ever felt like this. Everyone is against me. Everyone hates me. No one loves me. And it's just me against the world. It's funny because I feel like we've all been in at least one of these, all of these. I think I've hit every single one in a month, but um, that's just me. But if these are you, if you wake up and one of these things is telling, like staring you in the face, listen, the enemy's at your table. And not only is he at your table, but he's eating your lunch that God prepared for you. And he's just feeding you lies. And I know this because this was me not that long ago. When I first shared this message with the teens, it was back in January, um, we were going through a message, or we were going through a series, I'm so sorry, called Goliath Must Fall. And we were talking about the giants in our lives and how they just needed to like literally stay down forever. And in this time in our lives, like me and Kenzie were going through a rough time. Like we had a really bad giant for nine months. And for those who don't know, like we just welcomed our baby girl about four months ago, but those nine months of pregnancy was some of the hardest that we've ever had to face. Kenzie was in and out of surgeries. They sent her home on an IV that I had to change out. Like I had to be Nurse Corey for a long time and Nurse Corey was scared because um, I felt like if I didn't clean like something right, she was gonna get another infection and we were gonna end up in the hospital again. And honestly, like I got tired of sleeping on the couch. Like have you guys ever had to sleep on that little skinny couch at the hospital? You guys know what I'm talking about, come on. Like that in itself was horrible, okay? Like, I get it, Kenzie had the baby, whatever, but that couch, <laughs> it hurt so much. And it's so hard. Like, there's no cushion. It's like they literally took rocks and put it in there and they were like, good luck. Where was I? Um, I'm just kidding. Shh. Anyways, so um, we, it, was, it, was a hard, it was a hard nine months for us. And um, I ended up reaching out to a friend and he kind of went through the same thing. Him and his wife were having twins. Um, they were a couple months ahead of us. They actually had their twins in November. So in January, I reached out to him. And um, I was just like, hey, man, like, I honestly, like, I do. I feel surrounded. Um, I was like, bro, I feel like we're not going to make it out of this season. I said, it's been going on too long. And I told him, and honestly, like, if we want to get to the root of the problem, I said, bro, like, I also don't feel like I'm good enough for this. Like, I don't feel like I earned this family. And like, I'm sending him this text and anytime I send someone like a long text, like I want a long text back, okay? Like you better put thought into it, all right? <laughs> and so I send him this text and um, I waited and like the bubbles came up because we have iPhones. Um, and I was like, hi, he's texting back. And like, Three seconds later, I got something, and I was like, cool. Um, it was an accident. He's texting again. Um, he's going to come back and say, ha, ha, sorry, just kidding. Here's everything. Um, and honestly, in this moment, like, I just wanted him to be like, Corey, you're doing great. We love you. Like, everyone loves you. You're amazing. Um, like, I am a words of affirmation guy, and so when someone spits that out at me, my whole day gets better. I did not get that. I got nine words, all right? And that was it. But his nine words were exactly what I needed in that moment. And um, 
like how crazy is it to like have a friend who knows exactly what you need in the moment, who knew that Corey didn't need admiration, he didn't need love, he didn't need praise, he needed a wake-up call. Because as I looked at that phone, the nine little words were, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. And I said, oh, okay, Tyler, um, now what? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but in this moment, I was like, man, yeah. In that moment, I went to my table. And I thought about everything that I went on. And I knew in this moment what I had to do. Because here's the beauty of the table. We have this authority to take back our table. And here's the crazy thing. So Peter warns us, because in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, and that someone is you, let's be honest, all right? And while we don't have the authority to stop him from prowling around, we definitely have the authority to boot him out of our table. And it's not in our authority that we get to do this, but it's in the authority of Jesus Christ who came down, who died, who gave us the power to take every thought captive, to break down every stronghold, to destroy every lie. And it's in this authority that we get to sit here and tell the devil that he cannot have our table. So how do we do this? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked. Check this out. This is how you take back authority over your table. You sit down and you just lock eyes with your shepherd. And you say, lead the way. When you sit back at your table, when you lock eyes with your king, when you give him control over your life, when you allow him to do everything he needs to do and everything he wants to do, and all you have to do is follow him like the sheep we are, we begin to change. And after we sit and start having conversations with God, the next step, honestly, like, here's the thing with the devil, and I feel like he's just a one-trick pony because he's always trying to get into your mind and he's trying to doubt, get you to doubt everything that God has. So how do we combat lies? With what? With truth. So how do we stop the enemy from filling our head with lies? What do we have to fill our heads with? How do we fill our heads with truth? Read your Bible! <laughs> like what? That's it. Like when you start to read your Bible, when you start to fill it up with truth, like the devil can't spit lies in your head because there's already truth in your head and you already know the truth. Yes. It's crazy. But if we just read our Bibles, this wouldn't happen. And I know this because this was me. Growing up, um, Growing up, my biggest problem in the whole world was I always felt like I had to earn all the love that I got. From friends, from family, from classmates, work, whatever. I had to work for it because I had to earn it. That's just the way the world works. You got to earn everything you get. And so I did things I shouldn't have done. I had to change who I was to kind of fit in with some other people. And honestly, it just turned into a bad situation that we're really not going to go down that rabbit hole, all right? Um, but that's who I was. But then I started coming to church, and honestly, it was this church, let's be honest, uh, when I was like 17 years old, and I started hearing stories of this God who loved freely, and it made no sense to me whatsoever. I never knew of somebody who could love so freely, who could love and not want anything back. And so I started reading more, and as I read more and I learned the truth more, like, it started to make sense. And I would read things like in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, it said, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift from God. Not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for God. For, I'm sorry. For good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Like here was a God, one, who loved Corey for Corey and just wanted to give him something for free. It made no sense at all, but okay. But I kept reading. And then you come to like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Like, okay, so not only do you love me, but you, like, you gave up something for me. And like, I didn't even do anything. And then like, for what kind of love is this that one man should lay down his life for another? And as I continue to read, it started to click in Corey's head that here was a God who loved Corey for Corey. 
here's a God who loved Corey, and Corey honestly didn't have to do anything back. Like, these are the truths I needed. This is what I had to get from him. And my biggest problem was, honestly, I just didn't know the difference between God's voice and the voice of the enemy. So real quick, I'm going to give you guys two things, and then we're going to do an activity together, and we're going to have some fun. All right, check us out. So how do we recognize God's voice? How do we learn God's voice, first off? Well, you got to spend time with him. You want to learn God's voice? You got to sit at the table and talk to him. When me and Mackenzie are at the supermarket and we're across the produce section and she's like, hey, babe, I know her, hey, babe, from every other wife's, hey, babe, because we spend time with each other and I know her voice, okay? When Oakley's crying in the middle of like other babies, I know that's her cry because she cries so much at the house. (laughs) And I have memorized her cry. And her cry is different from other babies' cries. So how do you learn God's voice? You spend time with him. When you talk to God, he talks back sometimes. And you get to memorize his voice. And then you know his voice is different from others. John 10, 27 said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Man, isn't that crazy? Another thing, and this is something we tell the kids all the time, is that um, when the world kind of gives you things to learn whether it's from God or not, you kind of just have to pick up your Bible and like shift these things through it. Kind of like how a gold miner will shift the dirt to get to the pure stuff. Ah, that's what the Bible's for. What? You're welcome. Um, so when you start to look these things up, and if it's in the Bible, then, I mean, there's a good chance it's true. If it's not there, God probably ain't say it. Like, it's that simple. And so when the enemy sits at your table and he tries to tell you that you have no purpose, that you suck, you're not loved, and everybody hates you, you get to fight back with verses that you memorize, like Jeremiah 1.5 that said, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So when he sits at your table and he's trying to tell you these things, you get to say, no, homeboy, because check it, because my God said, one, that I'm loved, and two, that before I was even formed in the womb, he had a purpose and a plan for me. So while I still have breath in my lungs, he has a plan for me, and I'm going to continue to walk in that and do whatever I need to do. So honestly... You can just Job 13.5. And those who read their Bible laughed. For those who didn't read their Bible, it's a beautiful verse. Um, It's shut up and let that be your wisdom, okay? And sometimes you just got to use that on the devil. You're right. He'd be like, Corey, you suck. Shut up and let that be your wisdom, right? Get out of here. (laughs) All right. But hey, so um, here's the thing. So here's how I kind of want to end this morning with you guys. Um, these lies that the enemy brings, honestly, they're just that. They're lies. They're lies that he made up. They're lies that make no sense. And they're lies that he's just honestly trying to get you to doubt the character of God and get you to turn and rebel against everything that God has. And we combat lies with truth. We combat lies with truth, and that's the only way. So um, I'm going to give you guys a two different ways to kind of respond to this message. And um, I have some note cards up here that if you want to use them, you can. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do this in just a second. But um, for me, not in the Bible that I have up here, but I have a Bible that um, Pastor Eric gave me when I graduated. And this little NLT Bible. And um, back in January, when all this kind of took place, um, In the corner of my Bible, I did something, and I kind of wanted to share it with you guys and um, see if you guys wanted to practice it with me. But what I did was, um, the first thing I did was I wrote down my lie. And my lie was very simple. Um, My lie was, I was defined by my scars. Therefore, shame and failure follow me wherever I go. And then right above my lie, what I did was um, I rewrote my story according to God's purpose. And so right above it, I wrote, um, I'm no longer defined by my scars. I'm defined by his scars. And how do I know he has scars? Because honestly, while we were sitting at the table together and talking, and he handed me a piece of bread 
I saw them. I spent time with him. I saw these things. I read these things. And then right under my new purpose, or right under the lie, I wrote the verse that helped me remember that all this would make sense. And my verse was very simple. It's just, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Corey was made new. Corey was made whole. Yes, I failed before. Yes, that followed me for a long time. But now I'm no longer defined by my scars. I'm defined by Jesus' scars. And because of his grace and because of his mercy and his love, those now follow me wherever I go. It's no longer shame and failure. It's love and mercy. And I get to put that on and walk into that every single day. And that's my new story. I'm defined by his scars. So why does he build the table in the presence of our enemies? Here's what I love about God. While we may hate it, while we may hate like having to be surrounded all the time, God shows up in your life sometimes at the perfect time to show his providence for others. And if you think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as soon as they were about to get thrown into the furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar came to them and he was like, listen, like, this is your last chance. Like, just bow and you won't, like, burn. And they were like, nah. They were like, we only bow to our God and he will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to praise him. And so they get thrown in a furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar did not care. He said, yeet. Um. But then God showed up. God moved. God showed his providence. He saved them. And when they came out, King Nebuchadnezzar was saved and he started believing in God because of this. And this is why God likes to build his presence. I'm sorry. This is why God likes to build his table in the presence of your enemies because when the rest of your enemies are standing at you and they're like, ha, I hate you. You suck. You're stupid. You can be like, yeah, but I got fruit. <laughs> like, hey, like look what my God did. What? Look, I got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Like, what up? Where are you at? Hey, like, yeah. Yeah. You want one? You, do you? Because, like, I got so many, Laura. There you go. Um, and here's the beauty. Like, anybody else want an orange? Because here's the greatness of it. Like, my God owns the orchard. Did I hit the baby? Okay, we're cool. Um, we can't throw an orange no more. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, Pastor Adam. Um, if anything, it was my baby, so like, I can't get in trouble. Uh, I love you. Um, so this is how we're going to end before I get in trouble again, guys. Um, I'm going to give you guys just two ways we can respond to this message. We're going to get through. I, I, no, the other boss... Um, I love you guys so much. All right, so hey, real quick. Um, here's how, so here's how we're going to respond to this message. Um, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to give you guys just two chances. Um, if the prayer team could come forward. Okay, cool. They're here. Um, here's how I just, I want to give you guys two ways we can respond to this message. Um, like I said, I do have note cards up here at the front. And if you want to practice that little activity that I kind of share with you guys, like feel free to. Like, if you are sitting here today and you're like, I know what my lie is. I know what the enemy's been trying to pound in my head. I know what he's been trying to take me. I know what he's been trying to steal from me and destroy. And if that's you, I do, like, encourage you to come and write it down. Because here's the thing about the enemy is, yeah, he kind of is a one-trick pony. And, like, every day, like, sometimes I wake up and, like, even this morning, like, I woke up and I was brushing my teeth. And the devil was like, Corey, you're not good enough for what you're about to do. And I was like, hey, you're wrong, because Jeremiah is something like that. It's like, ah, he loves me. I'm prepared. I'm new. Like, come on. Right? Like, he's going to continue to do it. And so I did. I wrote it down in my Bible. I also have written it down, like, in my car, because sometimes I'm driving and I get angry, and I'm like, God loves me. Okay, cool. Um, like, I put it in spaces where I need it. So I do encourage you to write it down. I do encourage you to write down your old story, your new story, and even a verse to back it up. That way you have something to look on when he comes back again.